Hey everybody, welcome to Tech Recess. I'm your host, Mike Larry, and by the power of deductive reasoning, that's Ben. Hey Ben, how you doing, buddy? It's good to see you. Definitely good to be seen. It's also good to see you too. <laughs> so tell me something, man, before we get into today's episode, what have you been up to lately? Like, what have you been working on this week? Um, besides housework, like the rest of the country, <laughs> um, <laughs> what have I been working on? I've been working on, it seems like, uh, remote connectivity resources and ways to help the organizations that I deal with um, work better with uh, all of these resources that are all working from home today. So I, um, I'm really just trying to uh, feel the incoming flood right now. <laughs> flood is right, man. Uh, we're getting it from all sides, it seems, where I'm at. Uh, I've been working on kind of building out our remote portfolio of training opportunities. Uh, so I've become a certified Fortinet fast track uh, delivery specialist or instructor this week just to help make us more viable during this time of lockdown. Um, so for our viewers who may not have any idea who the heck we are and why we're important to listen to or what Tech Recess actually is, maybe we should actually tell them a little bit about ourselves. So my name is Mike. I am an uh, enabler. I am an educator. Uh, I've been spending the last few years as an enablement architect and uh, instructor. Uh, the last 10 years before that, I was a professional services engineer doing on-site professional services and consulting, mainly within the service provider vertical. I have a very strong technical background in service provider switch fabric architecture, routing, and security solutions. Uh, I've dealt with global utility companies and dealt with government defense contracts as well. And that's my professional life. In my personal life, I'm a husband, a stepfather, a former Division One athlete trying to hold on to all of my youth that I can. Uh, and I've recently taken up archery, which could not have come at a better time because it's one of the few activities you can do while on lockdown in your backyard. <laughs> also, in my quest to still have physical contact, I've been training jujitsu for the last few years. So, Ben, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm definitely not as cool as that, so I'm not <laughs> sure I should ever follow your introduction ever again. That's valid. Um, I've been in the industry, IT industry, for 15 or so years, uh, dedicated to cybersecurity for the last 10 or so years, and um, really just I volunteer for cybersecurity stuff. So whether it's you know being uh, part of uh, advisory boards or uh, uh, for InfraGuard, it's just a passion of mine. I really love all things security, whether it's physical security, cybersecurity, it doesn't really matter. Um, and so that kind of bleeds over into my personal life where I, I mean, I'll help friends install security cameras and booby traps for, <laughs> for people, uh, porch pirates, man. It's just <laughs> fun things like that are uh, really fun for me. Um, I was not a division one athlete. I was a division two athlete. So You're close enough, me, buddy. Close you enough. got me beat there. Uh, <laughs> you're better at me than archery. I mean, what else do you want me to say? I am not better <laughs> than you at archery. You have a 3D target. That that makes you better by default. You have <laughs> oh, an actual well, fake gear in your video. <laughs> So this, uh, this lockdown period must be like right in line with your personality as a security guy of not trusting anyone. This pretty much just flows right in your natural kind of frame of reference, right? I don't know if it does because now I'm always on the phone and I'm always <laughs> on the video. And I mean, I, I used to work from home and being on the video now, I can't pace. I can't walk around and I think by pacing and now I'm, I'm having to stare at the camera all day. And I, I'm actually more tired from working from home than I am working in the office. <laughs> interesting, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go ahead and jump in, into it. What is Tech Recess? Well, Tech Recess is an opportunity for Ben and I to come together and talk about things that we're interested in, whether it's things within the industry or not. It gives us a chance to talk to some of our other peers and subject matter experts and vendors within the industry to talk about new technologies and how they can apply to your life or in some other aspect. Uh, this gives us a chance to kind of break the monotony of our day-to-day -day life, come together for about 30 minutes and take a quick little recess from what we're doing just to talk and have some fun. Uh, the reason this kind of came about was because you, or like you, Ben and I are locked down and we're bored out of our minds. So we're looking for some way to provide some value, some educational content out there that is engaging and compelling and at least entertaining in some way and to avoid our families as well because we're starting to get driven kind of nuts. So with that being said, Ben, you've been a naughty boy. Go to timeout. Oh, it's my timeout corner. Um, so this is really just a segment where we talk about whatever I want to talk about because I'm controlling and I'm in security and I get to do whatever I want. Um, and really what I want to talk about right now is the 
the coming together that I'm seeing in the industry. Um, from, from my point of view, what I have seen out there is really um, a, a collaboration between what could be competitors in the industry and they're, they're, they're really coming together from a, uh, a viewpoint of what can we do to help customers and organizations get through this and get through this securely. Uh, and how, do, how are they doing that? They're doing that by offering extended trials, by offering free licenses, by offering ways to VPN in or ways to securely coll collaborate with your or remote workforce and things like that. So, um, I mean, I really just want to call out uh, if you are still struggling trying to find ways to get remote workforce out there, I think we're in week four of lockdown now. Uh, if you're still struggling to find ways, reach out to your partner, reach out to your vendor. They know of uh, ways to help you and ways to help you at very low cost, if not free uh, for the um, for the immediate future anyway. All right. So that's it for Time Out Corner. Don't make me put you there again. I want you to just think about what you've done. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait till next week. <laughs> so next up, we have a segment we like to call Show and Tell. Can you tell our viewers what the purpose of Show and Tell actually is? Show and Tell is, you know, we, we're all fifth graders at heart. We all like recess. We all like to, you know, brag about all our fun, cool toys and things like that. Um, and Show and Tell is a way for sponsors to come give free things to our viewers and help our viewers uh, learn more about the things that they're doing. So um, with that said, I'll let you give a, a brief intro to our sponsor of the day. Our sponsor of the day is Deep Instinct. They are changing the way at, at how we look at cybersecurity by harnessing the power of deep learning to prevent threats in zero time. Now, Ben, I have a question for you. Is zero time quicker than real time? It's instantaneous. Instantaneous time. <laughs> it's light speed. So joining us from Deep Instinct to give us a quick blurb about them is Mr. Brian Black. Brian, thank you so much for joining us, man. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Mike. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. So give us just a little rundown. What is Deep Instinct? Sure. Deep Instinct is the first company in cybersecurity to apply end-to-end -end deep learning to try and solve the problem of cybersecurity by eliminating false positives and increasing efficacy rate by using artificial brains to do the work instead of human-generated feature extraction or signatures or anything to that effect. Wow, that's a pretty quick blurb. Ben, did you have any follow-up that you wanted to say before we kicked Brian off of here for the moment? No, I mean, I think that's a great, uh, great start. And all I would say is that if you like what you hear today about the technology that is kind of the underpinning of Deep Instinct, uh, reach out to me, Mike, or Brian on LinkedIn, email, phone, text, however you know us. Uh, definitely we'll be glad to uh, teach you more about who they are. And what is our email address for the viewers, Ben? Do you have that off the top of your head? Oh, you would ask me that. Um, I, it's something at gmail.com, right? Uh, it's technology <laughs> recess at gmail.com. I set there you, you up and you couldn't even finish. I'm trying to no. get the assist over here. You're killing me. <laughs> All right, Brian, thank you so much, man. We'll talk to you here in just a minute. So today's topic is one that I'm really interested in. Uh, as somebody who feels like they've been alive through the entire evolution of robotics and artificial intelligence and seeing how all these things have proliferated from science fiction pieces and movies into our daily lives and now seeing how neural networks are empower empowering things like autonomous driving. This is something that I'm super interested in, so I'm really excited about having our guest speaker on today. Uh, we'll bring him back right now for round two. It is Brian Black with Deep Instinct. So Brian is, uh, he's a Philadelphia-based distinguished security engineer with over 20 years <clears throat> of experience in cybersecurity and intelligence. Uh, he leads Deep Instinct security management uh, engineering team overseeing North and South American territories. He's a thought leader and technology evangelist with a wealth of knowledge on AI, deep learning, and machine learning. In his time off, he can often be found on the lecture circuit giving talks around online security and state-sponsored threat actors. And when he's not fishing or competing in online CTF hacking or competitions, that's what he does best. So Brian, thank you again for joining us and talking to us about today's topic. And in just two words, today's topic to me is deep learning. So I really kind of want to get into it, man. Thank you again. Sure. 
So we hear about AI and artificial intelligence in every piece of new technology today. And like I said, whether it's in a movie, some science fiction piece, or in some new technology that's empowering our customers to help provide next-gen services or operate more efficiently, if you could just kind of dumb it down into what you think AI is to someone that may not be versed in it, how would you explain what artificial intelligence is? Sure. So artificial intelligence is kind of an interesting term today, only because it is so ubiquitous and it's being used so liberally. Uh, just a real quick kind of side blurb, uh, about six, maybe eight months ago, I actually saw a uh, inspection, uh, a state inspection uh, garage here in Pennsylvania say that their uh, inspection technology was powered by AI. Everyone is powered by AI today. Those words are just, they're tacked on to, to everything from water dispensers to cybersecurity to cars. But to say you're powered by AI kind of says I'm a digital company or I'm web-based. It really doesn't mean anything because Artificial intelligence, the definition is pretty simple. It's just a way to mimic human intelligence by automating some program or, or some system, I should say. So can a computer do something on its own independent of a human? We've had that since the 1950s. You could even argue the 1940s. Uh, so it's really not something overly advanced. We have to more correctly talk about what types of AI there are. So you mean the the algorithm that I wrote in freshman computer science, <laughs> that was artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. In fact, I, I know everyone talked about uh, Deep Blue defeating Gary Kasparov in the 1990s as a, as a breakthrough of artificial intelligence. But in reality, Deep Blue really wasn't that smart. It was just simply a giant chess calculator. It threw hardware at the problem. It had billions of different moves within a database that it could access relatively quickly because of the speed of its hardware and capabilities. But it wasn't particularly intelligent. It didn't make you know revolutionary moves. It just played very smart games and relied on a human getting tired. That's how it won. So with that point in mind, what is the, uh, the accomplishment now of artificial intelligence beating the world champion Go player? How does that compare to the example that you just gave us? That is awesome. Uh, so <laughs> to kind of talk about that real quick, uh, it was... I don't want to hand number a number of years ago, most data scientists agreed we were still pretty far off from beating the best humans at Go. Because if you take the world's most advanced chess calculator or chess computers, chess programs, and teach them how to play Go, they still played like toddlers. So it, Go is an extremely difficult and, and, and challenging game from a strategic standpoint, far, far more challenging than chess is. Uh, Google said that was unacceptable, uh, said, hold my beer, and decided to use. <laughs> Uh, their deep mind division to build an artificial brain in just uh, a number of months defeated the world's number one go player and since then they've uh they've built artificial brains to defeat that one uh that's a cool story but actually i kind of want to relate back to chess again real quick the coolest part to me was they took alpha go and in just four hours of training they said okay you've mastered uh the game of go you've defeated the number one player on earth they turned it on the game of chess and it taught itself for just four hours and then it took on the number one chess playing computer on earth, Sackfish 8, and did not lose a single game against it across 100 matches, but defeated it 27 times. Four hours of training. That's the power of an artificial brain and deep learning versus, say, something more traditional like machine learning. Wow. Now, how does an artificial brain and deep learning in the context that you just referenced it kind of compare to neural networks? And I know that I might be kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but when I think of neural networks and how they train themselves, it kind of just relates to what you just said with this ability to learn within four hours the entire rule set of chess and then beat the world's best chess player. So can you kind of talk to that, please? And the sure. reason why he's asking that question is because he drives a car that has a neural network back ending it or something like that. I don't know. I hear about this in my text message chain with him all the time. This guy <laughs> talks like he doesn't drive a Tesla also. He's killing me. <laughs> um, sure. So whether you're talking about machine learning or deep learning, it's all kind of built on various neural networks. Now, we can't think of a neural network as a single model. Uh, there are dozens of different types. There's uh, ELMs or extreme learning machines. There's, uh, um, there's uh, deep feed forward uh, neural networks. There's deep neural networks. There's convolutional neural networks for current. So you're really trying to build a input output model that can solve the problem. So to kind of give you a quick example, example, convolutional neural networks are fantastic for image recognition, not that good for binary analysis. So you have to kind of pair the right tool with the, with the right um, problem. But it's all essentially 
a neural network is a series of algorithms and an input output model that arrives at a conclusion with a certain degree of probability, usually pretty high. So, so I hear about machine learning all the time, um, you know, whether it's ML or um, what have you, the, the next buzzword out there. Um, is, is that another word for deep learning or what's the difference between, is there a difference? There is. Uh, so, well, there is, let's put an asterisk by it and kind of talk about it. So deep learning is a subset of machine learning. It is a specific set of algorithms within the machine learning context and model. So the reason you kind of frame it like that is because I don't want people to think that it's an entirely new development that we've come up with. Uh, with that said, though, they are profoundly different in that a deep neural network develops artificial brains by essentially learning on its own through a series of uh, input layers, weighted uh, neurons that they're called uh, at the mathematical level, and then backpropagation for testing. Whereas a machine learning model is built on what they call feature extraction. So feature extraction is essentially a human telling a computer what it's supposed to be learning. Whereas with deep neural networks, it processes on raw data. So it, a human doesn't have any part in that. Interesting. So, so what do you mean by feature extraction? What, what is, can you tell me more about what that is? Sure. Uh, and that's kind of the, the, it's been the challenge of machine learning. So machine learning has been around for, for a number of years. It really rose to prominence in the 1980s. And it was cool. It, it's, it's, it's awesome, to be honest with you. I mean, it allows us to talk to computers. It allows uh, for image recognition. It allowed for the first facial recognition systems. It's really cool because it can make inferences. But the way it kind of works is that a data scientist explains to the computer what features it's looking for. So let's kind of give you an example. If I wanted to teach a computer what a dog is, there's one way to do it. I could write a signature for the dog. I can say if it has this color, this size, then it's a Labrador, a Labrador or, or a Poodle or something. But if I wanted to find any dog, I can't be too specific. I have to give it features. It has to be you know, within this size. It has to have this ratio between the eyes and the ears. It has to have this many you know, paws or something to that effect. Whereas, but that's not how a human learned. A human learned through ingesting raw data. Your parents just simply said, that's a dog. And you said, great, got it. Uh, so that's how humans learn, and that's how deep neural networks learn. They don't learn by a human teaching what the features are. They learn by absorbing the entire information at once. Gotcha. So um, I, I've been doing some research out in my front yard. Uh, <laughs> I got a bunch of cameras to view my bird feeders. Um, and I was thinking, you know, what else could I use cameras for? I've got a, a road out there. Um, how about I just throw a camera out there and use uh, some software to uh, go and look at license plates, uh, for example, uh, kind of like the NYPD, but in Arkansas. <laughs> um, so is, is that, uh, they say they're powered by AI. I'm, I'm assuming that when I send them the video, that's what they're doing. They're doing feature extraction, looking for something that looks like a license plate. Almost certainly, because okay. a license plate has very specific features. It has X number of characters. It's in a defined area within a car, usually. It has a, a regulated size. So it would be very easy to build a feature set for that. Gotcha. Um, some things are very difficult to build a feature set for that uh, for. So for instance, let's say that if I wanted a computer to identify the difference between a dog and a cat, that's way harder than people think it is. Not for a human. Humans, we got it down. We're, we're world experts in dog, dogs and cats. But for a computer, they both are roughly the same size, depending on the breed. Uh, they both have, they're both furry. They both have tails in the same place, ears in the same place, nose in the same place. They both have four paws. It, from a feature perspective, they're awfully similar. Um, sure, cats have retractable claws, but uh, when they're out, they're still claws at the end of a paw, paws furry. When they're in, computer can't process on data, it can't see. Uh, yeah, they've got different kind of eyes, but then the algorithm would break every time it came upon a sleeping animal. So it's, it's a tough problem to solve for a computer, but humans don't have a problem with that, and neither does deep learning. So if, if machine learning utilizes this feature extraction to kind of hone and teach itself, mm -hmm. you know, what, what process does deep learning use to teach itself or hone itself comparatively? Sure. So deep learning uses, uh, as I mentioned before, raw data. So data is king when it comes to deep learning. The more you have, the better it gets. And this is actually an interesting uh, tidbit. You don't see that with machine learning. Machine learning can actually plateau. The more information you give it, as long as it's working on the same feature set, it doesn't get smarter. But let's kind of take it back to humans again. When you first begin to play a musical instrument, you hit the wrong notes, you don't know that much. Or speak a language, you say the wrong verb or noun. And when you're driving, you probably weren't very good in the beginning. 
the more you do, the more you were exposed to a data set, whether it's more nodes, more music, more language, or more driving, you simply become better at it. Deep learning is the same way. We even see that with your Teslas. Uh, the first ones that uh, came off the, not the assembly line, the first ones that were built in the labs uh, couldn't go around a circular track and they kept uh, <laughs> getting confused between stop signs and yield signs. And today they navigate LA traffic because they effectively grew up, right? They, they uh, saw more information and they can learn more of the world around them. Yeah, that's one that's of the awesome. advantages that the Tesla has over every other manufacturer out there is they have more data collection points out there on the road. They have the largest fleet with these cameras and this suite of sensors to take in that data. Not that I'm going to get sidetracked and talk about Tesla, Ben, I promise. I'm just <laughs> saying it is a very real world example. And, and I've been a, a Tesla owner now for almost three years. And the difference that it can do from a driving perspective is astronomical from when I got it three years ago to what it's, a, what it's capable of doing today. I yeah, think that's a that's a perfect example of being able to grow. Um, just, I mean, I've got two little boys, and the, seeing them grow by learning rather than teaching them features that that's really helping me understand the differences. Um, I, I do have one question. I don't think you're going to be able to answer this, but Mike and I do have a friend that we have been trying to teach how to spell for the past <laughs> ten years, and he cannot spell. He can't spell your, and he can't spell their at all he gets the those confused all the time is can we use some sort of technology to help him or at least change our text message chain with him? he's hopeless he's hopeless <laughs> i was gonna say you know that's actually not impossible to do it wouldn't be inconceivable for a company like microsoft or or google or whatnot to read an entire sentence and then understand context and auto flip words depending on what it thinks the context would be. We do kind of see that at Microsoft Word a little bit when it makes its grammatical uh, suggestions. We also see it with programs like Grammarly where you'll write something and it will understand if uh, you're using apostrophe RE when you mean you know not that to, or vice versa. Uh, so can, can it be done? Yes. Uh, can it be done with someone who uh, is just on the fly? Uh, probably not. <laughs> oh man, you hear that, Eric? There's no hope for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so real quick, one thing that I wanted to ask you, Brian, is, man, if you go out and you Google anything about artificial intelligence and you, you are a fan of podcasts, you'll inevitably find a ton of podcasts talking about the dangers of unleashing AI upon the world. Mm -hmm. So with neural networks teaching neural networks, with computers essentially teaching computers, what's to prevent them from getting just bigger and bigger until they turn into Cyberdyne or a Skynet? You know, how do you actually tame uh, artificial intelligence to stay inside the line, so to speak? Sure. Well, let me tell you what the artificial brain here at Deep Instinct told me to say. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So there's a couple limitations uh, regarding that. So one is just honestly raw processing power. Deep neural networks are tough. They're architecturally challenging to build. This is not something you're going to run at a real advanced level on, say, a home laptop. Yes, you can go out to GitHub right now, download a nine or maybe it's a 12 line Python code with a single neuron in it uh, that is a deep neural network. It's pretty cool. Um, probably won't help you predict the lottery, but it's neat to get the foundations. Uh, but some of these machines require terabytes of RAM, re require GPUs that are not something you're going to buy off Amazon. I mean, we're talking, you know, fifty to hundred thousand dollars a piece. So the processing power re re uh, for some of these is is limiting. The more data you feed it, the more time it takes. You can overcome that with processing power, but then it becomes a uh, an exponential growth curve. Where if you want to build something like uh, like Skynet you'd probably have to leverage the entire computing power of the internet and then spend a significant amount of time teaching it. Uh, so really we're limited in that regard. The other thing that kind of limits a deep neural network is uh, the data. So as long as you're feeding it data uh, at an ever exponential uh, growth rate, then yes, it can continue to learn essentially forever. Uh, but of course, gathering that data, labeling that data to make sure you're not getting garbage in, garbage out, to make sure you're getting good input is time consuming. And all of that kind of limits the ultimate effectiveness. But it'll ramp up as time goes on. I mean, deep neural networks of 2030 are going to be you know, far more advanced than today. Yeah, when you so, start talking about time limits uh, or time being the limiting factor, I look at just the advancements of technology in my lifetime. And in the blink of an eye, we've gone from zero to 100 real quick. So I don't necessarily buy into that time as the limiting factor because within 10 years, the entire landscape can change. If you just look at Moore's Law, right, that's a pretty good argument for how quickly things can change. 
And don't think I'm not excited about the advent uh, in our lifetime of quantum computers and what effect they're going to have on, a, on an artificial brain's ability to learn. I think it's going to enter a very cool space. We are right there. We're right at the tipping point. I cannot wait to see what the computers of the next decade look like. So ben, cool. I cut you off. I didn't mean to, man. Go ahead. No worries. Um, uh, you mentioned lottery, and that just that got my mind thinking of like, is I know that's not we can't predict it, but is there is there a way that deep learning can help with randomness, or uh, is is there such a thing as true randomness, uh, and and how does that fit into deep learning and neural networks? There is no answer I can give to that that's not going to cause much of the internet to rise up with uh, <laughs> and, and torches. Uh, there's going to be, I'm in, of the segment that you cannot build true randomness into a computer algorithm. That is the, the, the lot sign of the line I am on. Right now, there are data scientists listening to this, uh, to this podcast that uh, want to kind of uh, ring me for that one because they're saying we can absolutely do it. Um, there's a lot of competing papers that have been published on the randomness of computers. Um, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer definitively uh, if it can, 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 if we can have true randomness or not. Well, I thought you were going to go a philosophical way too. So I mean, <laughs> either way is kind of a, a no-win scenario. Okay. Um, so how um, how are how is deep learning fitting into technology today? What are some of the most common applications other than this guy's car? Yep, self-driving cars are probably the most um, in your face version of, of deep learning. Uh, the medical field is doing awesome advancements mm. in it. Uh, some of the best things that I've seen so far are uh, doing MRI analysis. I mean, over the course of an entire lifetime, a human may be able to look at process and understand, let's call it thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of images. Whereas a deep learning uh, neural network and an artificial brain can process millions of MRI images in a matter of hours and learn incredibly uh, minute components to them to make far faster and far more accurate diagnoses. So I think that is going to be an incredible revolution when it comes to healthcare. Um, we're also seeing it in pharmaceutical um, work where uh, we're seeing drug development being driven by artificial brains. We're seeing it in the development specifically in uh, new antibacterial techno um, uh, treatments and, and technologies to counter uh, the, the ever dreaded superbug and, and natural resistances. So that's gonna be very cool. So there's a lot of uh, really cool applications in the healthcare industry. And, uh, and let's not rule out anything from uh, weather um, analysis. Uh, we've seen the first deep, uh, deep learning um, analysis models being launched to uh, study NASA's uh, weather data, which is you know, obviously huge. That's interesting. Uh, I have seen a lot from the medical space. Um, cancer has ran in my family uh, pretty prevalently. So it's a, a pretty important topic in my family. And seeing these machines that are now able to diagnose CT scans far more efficiently than a human can uh, is just really exciting. And that's just one area that I've been paying attention to for quite some time, just seeing how much more efficient we can be by leveraging these technologies in the medical field. Definitely. Ben, I don't have any other questions, I think, uh, right now. Do you have any closing comments or questions for Mr. Black before we send him off into the ether? Yeah, uh, just kind of one more. Uh, you mentioned GitHub and the Python script that you can go out and you know start. Um, what are some other ways that our viewers can uh, go out and learn more about deep learning, neural networks, AI? Um, how do they get more involved? Awesome. So this is a great opportunity for me to plug uh, my company a bit. Uh, so the, there is a really uh, good book out there. It's one of the uh, Learning for Dummies books. It was written by uh, our chief data scientist and co-founder, Dr. Ellie David. So it's a, it's a very quick read, but it really digs into the foundations of deep learning, which is going to be something that people can um, really understand. I think it's available for free in a PDF from our, our website. Uh, the others are we're seeing courses being placed online from the likes of MIT, where they're broadcasting them to YouTube and, and other locations that really get into the, uh, the nuances of deep neural networks and how they're being used and how they're being defined to kind of help people understand how they're built, because there are uh, a lot of quirks to them that uh, are hard to cover in 30 minutes or an hour, but uh, are certainly fascinating. I think as people get more uh, in tune with deep learning, they'll understand how these algorithms are really impacting their everyday life. I mean, everything from traffic patterns to, uh, well, self-driving cars. Man, that's awesome. Brian, on behalf of Ben and I both, man, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day to sit down and talk to not only us, but our audience about deep instinct and deep learning specifically, man. It was really informative and, and one of the topics that I was really excited to hear about. So I really do appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. All right, man. You have a good rest of your day. I'm kicking you out now.
Thanks. <laughs> All right, now we have the kickball kickoff, the call to action, where I leave you all with just some words of wisdom or just some actionable item. Uh, As the world is changing on a day-to-day basis, and we all go through this period of self-isolation and lockdown, I can tell you it's the the first time as an adult that I've ever felt like I'm grounded. So it's an interesting time. But with this time comes a silver lining, comes an opportunity. For the first time in a while as a professional, I now have opportunity to sit down and do something to better myself. And so that's my action item for you at home, to utilize this time as an opportunity to work on a skill, develop a new skill, to harness is some sort of ability that you have to better yourself because we're provided an opportunity right now that we may not ever get for the rest of our lifetimes. So whether it's cultivating a new skill, whether it's working on relationships that are important to you, seeing your family, connecting with your family on a daily basis, do something outside of the norm that you wouldn't typically do during this time because this opportunity hopefully will be short-lived. So that's all on behalf of Ben and I at Tech Recess. We want to say thank you so much for joining us for episode two. We hope that you join us next week for episode three. And if you like the content today, be sure to do all the normal stuff, like, comment, share, and subscribe. Do all the things that make the algorithm work in our behalf to help build this channel. So with that in mind, until next time, bye everybody.